Where did the protest slogan, I am a man, come from? We'll discuss that today on Footnoting History. Hello and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm Elizabeth, and recently I found myself wondering where the 1960s civil rights movement slogan, I am a man, came from. When teaching modern Western history, I usually put two images on my syllabus. One is a medieval drawing of the three estates, those who pray, those who fight, and those who work. For a long time in Western history, it was believed that each person fell into one of these categories. Understandably, the largest group was those that work, can't fight and pray unless someone else is growing your food. But next to this image, of the three of states on my syllabus was a picture of a group of African-American men from the Memphis sanitation strike in 1968. The men in the picture are marching and carrying signs that say, I am a man. The theme of my class was the growth of the individual and individual rights, and these images seem like really nice bookends. But even though I can talk for hours about the three estates, and I could, don't test me, I don't know where the phrase, I am a man, comes from. In the back of my head, I assumed it was something said by Shylock the Jew in his famous monologue in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. You know, if you prick me, do I not bleed? Am I not a man? Something like that. Well, it turns out I was wrong. I know, shocking. So here, my faithful listeners, is the story behind the sentence and slogan, I am a man. I have one editorial note. I decided to include quotes by various speakers and writers throughout this podcast. I thought that they made a more interesting and compelling story than any attempt by me to paraphrase them. If you've listened to my podcast before in which I use literature as evidence for history, you're not going to be surprised. Let's get started then. First, let's travel back to the late 18th century. Slavery is still legal and very much in play in both the United States and the United Kingdom. Male slaves are called boy a term used to make sure that all knew the person addressed was not a full man in the eyes of society, regardless of age. However, some have begun to have qualms about the institution of slavery. In the UK, people known as abolitionists joined together to discuss how to end the slave trade. In 1787, 12 men met in a print shop in London and joined together to create the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade. Every good society needs a logo, right? Well. Three of these men were taxed with the job of creating one, and they reached out to 57-year-old Josiah Wedgwood, who had been drawn to the abolitionist movement by a friendship with the man who created the first abolitionist party in Britain. As a master potter, Wedgwood did just what it sounds like. He made pots, excellent pots, and other ceramics. If you have ever come across Wedgwood and Bentley crockery, well, that's our man. Wedgwood created a medallion for the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade, say that five times fast, which depicted a slave in chains, kneeling, his hands grasped together and raised as if asking for mercy. Under the slave was a banner with the words, am I not a man and a brother? This question, created by an unknown member of the society for affecting the abolition of the slave trade, drove home the idea that a slave was not a boy or a child or a less than. It also called back to the biblical story of Cain and Abel, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, the abolitionists were saying, you very much are. Wedgwood and his excellent craftsmanship made this logo the must have of the late 18th century. A box of medallions and bracelets was even shipped in 1788 to Benjamin Franklin in the US for distribution. Think of it as the Livestrong bracelet of the 1790s. Within a short amount of time, Women were wearing this logo on bracelets and medallions. Wedgwood's crockery and the image in question were everywhere. By the end of the 18th century, this image was the most popular depiction of a black person in England. Okay, so the image of a slave in chains with the words, am I not a man and a brother, continued to appear on abolitionist works throughout the early 19th century as well. In 1837, American John Greenleaf Whittier published the poem, our countrymen in chains. On the printed sheet above the stirring poem was Wedgwood's logo. Whittier, friends with the radical abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, strove to make the point that slaves were Americans and countrymen. He decried that in slavery, quote, God's own image was bought and sold, 
Americans to market-driven and bartered as the brute for gold, end quote. This idea that slaves were not just property, but men and women holding the same citizenship and rights as others born in the United States was unsettling to many on the pro-slavery side. Whittier had already been stoned by anti-abolitionists in the early 1830s. Then he was hired as editor for the publication Pennsylvania Freeman in 1838, and that same year his office was destroyed by anti-abolitionists. But the question, am I not a man, continued to be asked, although in a variety of ways and by a variety of people. In 1851, former slave Sojourner Truth gave a speech at a woman's convention in Akron, Ohio. Her theme, ain't I a woman? Truth pointed out the hypocrisy of rejecting women's suffrage because women were too delicate or too stupid or that Christ wasn't a woman. As a black female slave, Truth had never been considered too delicate for manual labor. And, as she famously explained, quote, where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. However, the end goal, or the end point of Sojourner Truth, ain't I a woman, was to answer, black women were as much women as black men were as much men. One would think that this was an extremely simple concept to understand and yet argued time and time again. By the Civil War, the abolitionist logo created in 1787 had traveled across the sea and had been embraced and toyed with to not only represent anti-slavery groups, but women's rights. Finally, in 1857, the Supreme Court answered, it believed definitively, whether a former slave could be seen as an American citizen in the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford. Scott had lived as a slave, but in two free territories. And so he sued for his freedom based on the premise that in Missouri, once free, always free. The case went to the Supreme Court where Scott's lawyer, an abolitionist named Roswell Field, asked the justices, quote, that each of you at some point during your deliberations, consider for just a moment what it would be like to lose your freedom what it would feel like to be a slave, the chattel of another, what it would do to you to have the majority of those around you consider you as something less than a man. The court was not moved and it found that no person of African ancestry could claim citizenship in the United States. But then the Civil War erupted and after years of bloodshed and fighting, the slaves were freed. When the dust began to settle, a group of black men were elected in 1868 to the Georgia legislature as Republicans. Two months later, a group of white Georgia Democrats expelled them. The Reverend Henry McNeil Turner, an African Methodist Episcopal minister who had been elected and then ousted, stood before this legislature and gave a speech in which he said, quote, The great question, sir, is this. Am I a man? If I am such, I claim the rights of a man. Am I not a man because I happen to be of a darker you than honorable gentlemen around me? Let me see whether I am or not." End quote. Turner went on to destroy the arguments of scientific racists, those who argued that black people were biologically closer to the chimpanzee than a white person. In my favorite example, he explained that he had dissected over 50 men, black and white, and he could, quote, assert that by the time you take off the mucus pigment, the color of the skin you cannot, to save your life, distinguish between the black man and the white." End quote. He then also tore down the biblical justification for slavery and for treating black people as inferior. He was, after all, a minister. The question, am I not a man, continued to reverberate, albeit without the pointed and a brother. In 1875, a Civil Rights Act was passed. During the debate, Representative James Rapier of Alabama spoke. Rapier had been born in Atlanta in the 1830s as the son of a freed slave. He had then been educated in Canada, and yet Rapier's status as a freed-born black man did not prevent him from facing discrimination both before and after the Civil War. Rapier told Congress that, quote, nothing short of a complete acknowledgement of my manhood will satisfy me, end quote. He stated that, quote, every day my life and property are exposed, are left to the mercy of others, and will be so long as every hotel keeper, railroad conductor, and steamboat captain can refuse me with impunity. After all, this question resolves itself into this. Either I am a man 
for I am not a man. End quote. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 was passed, but struck down in 1883 as the Supreme Court found that protections did not extend to private business. And then, in the 1890s, the Supreme Court case of Plessy v. Ferguson found that separate was indeed equal when it came to race. Throughout the early 20th century, black Americans continued to find themselves regulated to second-class status. Even as the Harlem Renaissance introduced black culture to so many Americans in the 1920s, those afraid of differences banded together. It is no coincidence that the KKK also saw a resurgence in the decade. Between unwanted immigrant groups to the growing popularity of black singers and writers, the old guard tried to convince Americans that what our nation truly needed was a return to the past where everyone knew their place. Service by black Americans in World War II helped fuel the demand for equal rights when these men returned home. In 1952, Ralph Ellison, a writer and an African-American, published a book called Invisible Man, about black identity in 20th century America. As Ellison explains in this work, quote, I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those that haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, because people refuse to see me, end quote. But before all else, he is a man. The 1950s, however, did see the undoing of the argument that separate was equal when it came to education. Potentially, the Supreme Court only heard the case of Brown versus Board of Ed because of international pressure from the Cold War. How could the U.S. hold itself up as a bastion of democracy and equality if some of its citizens were legally separate, segregated? The court decided, in fact, it was not legal. Desegregation and integration began to slowly roll through the land, quickened by the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, in which it was decreed that private businesses offering public accommodations could not legally discriminate. This overview now brings us back to our question at the beginning of our episode. In the 1960s, the civil rights movement began to pick up steam. And then in 1968, two black sanitation workers, Echo Cole and Robert Walker, were crushed to death in the back of their garbage truck. It was raining and black workers in Memphis at that time were only allowed to she seek shelter from the rain in the back of their trucks with the compressor. In reaction to their deaths and the lack of regard from the city, 1,300 African-American sanitation workers walked off the job. The strikers carried signs which answered the question of the society for affecting the abolition of the slave trade by declaring unequivocally, I am a man. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.